Good evening and welcome to the second spring 2022 program of St. Leo University Center for Catholic Jewish Studies. Tonight's program is entitled Understanding Jesus and Paul Means Understanding Judaism, Pharisees, Prayer, Parable, and Practice, featuring Dr. Amy Jill Levine. My name is Matthew Tapey, and I am an Associate Professor of Theology at St. Leo University and Director of the Center for Catholic Jewish Studies. For those who may not know, especially friends tuning in from outside of Florida, St. Leo University is the oldest Catholic institution of higher education in Florida, established in 1889 by the Order of St. Benedict of Florida. The Center for Catholic Jewish Studies, or CCJS for short, was established in 1998. Its mission is to build mutual respect and understanding and appreciation among Jews, Catholics, and all people of goodwill by providing opportunities for interfaith education and dialogue. The CCJS remains the only academic center of its kind in the Southeastern United States. Tonight, we have the honor of being joined by the Bishop of the Diocese of St. Petersburg, Bishop Gregory Parks. Bishop Parks has been serving as the Bishop of St. Petersburg since 2017. He has kindly accepted our invitation to offer a few closing comments to the program. Bishop Parks, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Tapey. Thank you. Although our program is online tonight and we can't see each other in person, please know that your time and your interest in the program is treasured and makes a real difference. We have over 315 people registered for the program from across, across Florida and beyond, including scholars from multiple universities and seminaries. These include Sacred Heart Seminary, Moody Theological Seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary, Calvin Seminary, Liverpool Hope University in England, John Carroll University in Ohio, Harding University in Arkansas, Rochester University in New York, University of St. Thomas, Minnesota, Boston College, Yale University, University of Aberdeen, University of Manchester, University of St. Andrews, Johannes Gutenberg Universität of Mainz, Germany, University of Munich, Germany, Humboldt University of Berlin, Germany, and the John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin, Poland, the Pontifical Gregorian University of Rome, and the Catholic University of Zimbabwe. So we have an international audience tonight. We are also joined by members of multiple Jewish congregations in Florida, parishioners from at least 22 Catholic churches, mostly in Florida and a few in the Northeast, the Benedictine Sisters of Florida, numerous Catholic deacons, Protestant brothers and sisters, and we are joined by staff from Jewish institutions such as the Champ Tampa Jewish Federation, Jewish Federations of Manatee in Sarasota, Florida, and the Jewish Press. Many thanks to all of you for joining us. I want to especially thank our program co-sponsor, the Diocese of St. Petersburg, Florida. I now want to introduce you to our featured speaker. And as I do so, keep in mind that as Dr. Levine speaks, you can submit questions that you have or that occur to you using the question and answer button at the bottom of the Zoom uh, screen. Dr. Amy Jill Levine is the Rabbi Stanley M. Kessler, Distinguished Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at Hartford Seminary and Professor of New Testament Studies Emerita at Vanderbilt University. Her numerous publications include The Misunderstood Jew, The Church and the Scandal of the Jewish Jesus, The Jewish Annotated New Testament, Second Edition, edited with Mark Brettler, the Bible with and without Jesus, how Jews and Christians read the same stories differently. And in, 20, in 2020, the Sermon on the Mount, a beginner's guide to the kingdom of heaven. In August, 2021, Levine published The Difficult Words of Jesus, a beginner's guide to his most perplexing teachings. In, De in December of 2021, Dr. Levine published The Pharisees, which she also co-edited with Joseph Sievers. Dr. Lean is the first Jewish scholar to teach New Testament at Rome's Pontifical Biblical Institute. In 2021, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2009, Dr. Levine received the Center for Catholic Jewish Studies Eternal Light Award, an award that has been given since 1998 to scholars who have, been, who have made outstanding contributions to Catholic Jewish studies. So Dr. Levine, welcome back to the Center for Catholic Jewish Studies. We're glad to have you back again. And we, and we now turn the floor over to you. Thank you for that kind and generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Um, would that we could do this at some point on site. So greetings all from Nashville, Tennessee. 
uh, my job at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, they rebranded in the fall, uh, has me teaching a course on parables there intensively in June. And if anybody wants to come study parables with me, you can come do this, such as the magic of Zoom. The other magic of Zoom is that if I say anything that you feel needs follow-up or you have an alternative reading, that's fine. As Matthew noted, you can post a question into the Q&A, or if you want to write to me later, you can still reach me at my Vanderbilt University email address. I don't want people leaving and thinking, I didn't like what she said about something. So if you've got an issue, write to me. Because the point of biblical studies, any sort of interfaith dialogue, is not so that at the end of the day, we all hold hands and sing kumbaya, um, or if you're Jewish, hine matovu manayim shevedachim gam yachad, you know, how good and pleasant it is when siblings dwell together. Uh, the point is that we share different insights and we may come up with mutually exclusive readings. And the marvelous thing about religion, other than elementary school mathematics, is we can completely disagree with each other and we can both be right. So through the miracle of modern technology, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. I hope that this works, whoops. Um, and here we go. Yep, that should work. I'm trusting that participants can see me. Matthew, can you see? Yes. Bishop, can you see? Good, because I can see you in the corner of my screen. As long as you're there and you're still awake, I'm good. Um, we're talking about how understanding Jesus and Paul means understanding Judaism. Because if we don't understand Judaism, at least Second Temple Judaism, the Judaism that was practiced and believed at the time of Jesus and Paul, then we're going to get them wrong. And if we get them wrong, it's just bad for everybody. And we'll do this by taking a couple of test cases, like practice. Like, what did Jesus and Paul do in terms of being Jewish, uh, in terms of the Our Father prayer, on which we could spend an entire hour, but we're only going to do just a brief uh, foretaste of that. We'll look at how Pharisees are being portrayed, and then we'll use as our test case a parable that actually features a Pharisee, sometimes called the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And ideally, we will do this within an hour, then we have time for Q&A. So here's my outline. Here's how I'm going to go about doing this. I'll tell you what my biases are, because I'm an historian, and all historians have biases, right? We decide what information to bring forward and what to ignore. Uh, we decide how to spin information. So I'll tell you what my biases are, and then when we start looking at practice and piety and prayer and Pharisees and parable, isn't it nice that they all begin with P, um, uh, you can determine whether I'm speaking through my biases or whether I'm being a good, solid, rigorous historian. I should also note that one can be biased and right. I put up here, just as a visual, this is Mark Chagall's White Crucifixion, Chagall Escaped the Nazis. Um, just to show that Jews have been thinking about Jesus for a very long time. It's not as if on Easter and Sunday, the Jews went over here and the followers of Jesus went over here and they never talked about each other. In fact, there's a substantial reclamation of the Jewish Jesus and now the Jewish Paul. And that shows part of the advancement in Jewish Christian relations is we can now start looking at how the symbols function and we see Jews reclaiming Jesus as one of ours. Here's what my parents told me, and these are my biases. I grew up in a predominantly Portuguese Catholic neighborhood in southeastern Massachusetts. So Christianity to me went, meant Roman Catholicism. The first person I met who registered to me as a Protestant, I met when I went to university. So for me, the default has always been Roman Catholicism. My parents told me that we worship the same God, the one who created heaven and earth, that we share books in common like Genesis or Isaiah or the Psalms that we share common values like love of God and love of neighbor. They told me that a Jewish man named Jesus and a Jewish woman named Mary, it turns out there's more than one Mary, but all the Mary, they were all Jewish. And they also said to me, it's good to know about your neighbor's religion. So I, when I would ask questions about what my Catholic friends were doing, like why did they have worship services on Sunday when we had ours on Saturday? Um, why were they using Latin? I'm that old enough to remember that when we were using Hebrew. They gave me positive answers because they wanted me to have respect for the religious tradition of my neighbors. I also learned a lot about religion in public school because we all went to public school. So in public school at Job S. Gidley School in North Dartmouth, Massachusetts, we sang Christmas carols. I still think that Silent Night is a much prettier song than I had a little dreidel, which was the one Jewish song that they gave us. Um, we, we had Christmas trees and we had Santa and we had Easter eggs and bunnies and all that other stuff. 
And in Mrs. Cross's class, her name was really Mrs. Cross, which turned out to be prescient, but who knew then? In Mrs. Cross's class in first grade, we would all fold our hands and bow our heads and we would say the Our Father prayer with the doxology. Um, nobody told me that this was a Christian prayer because there's nothing about Jesus in it. And I thought, boy, this is a Jewish prayer. It turned out I was right. Um, so I, like other children who went to public school in the late 1950s and early 1960s, even Jewish kids knew this prayer. And then one day, this little girl on the school bus said to me, you killed our Lord. And I responded, I did not kill anybody. Because if you killed somebody, you would know, palpably you would know. And she said, yes, you did. Our priest said so. Now, this is my first lesson in interreligious conversation. And the fact that sometimes when we don't know stuff, we just fill in the blanks with lots of nonsense. And that's why it's important for Jews and Christians to speak with each other and for us to study our, our different traditions, because otherwise we're going to fill in with nonsense. The technical term for this would be mishagas, a good Yiddish term for nonsense. We're going to fill in with mishagas. So this little girl said, our priest said, you're responsible for killing God. I said, I'm not. Um, and then I thought, wait a minute. I said to the little girl, is the priest dead? Because I knew priests had to wear these special collars. So if you can see the bishop in, in, your, in your little screenshot, one of those collars is right there because he's wearing one. So I thought the reason priests had to wear these collars was because were the priest to tell a lie, the collar would choke the priest. I think, by the way, this is a splendid idea. It would make homilies ever so much more careful. So I said, is the priest dead? because this was such a whopper of a lie, the caller would have choked the priest. And she said, no, he's doing quite fine. So I, being a rational child, think, the priest said I'm responsible for the death of God. The caller did not kill the priest. Therefore, by the transitive property of deicide, I must be responsible for killing God. I was convinced I killed God. So I get off the school bus. This is the very early 1960s. My mother meets me at the bus. I'm crying. She said, what's wrong? I said, I killed God. Um, it took her a while to figure out exactly what happened, but when she did, she assured me that, that God was doing just fine, which to my seven-year-old heart was an enormous relief. And as I found out much later, she made a few calls to the local diocesan office. Something called Vatican II had already started, but among the later documents of Vatican II for October of 1965 was a document called Nostra Aetate, Latin for In Our Time. It's a brilliant document that says Jews at all times and all places cannot be held responsible for the death of Jesus. And this creates a sea change in Catholic religious education, which then influenced many Protestant churches as well. So the Roman Catholic Church was actually well ahead of the curve in trying to undo centuries of the teaching of contempt. But I came in before that. I could not understand why this beautiful tradition that had the same God and the same prayers and all of those Jewish Marys and a Jewish guy named Jesus, how could somebody from this tradition be saying horrible things about me? So I announced to my parents, you can probably tell I'm an only child. I announced to my parents that I was going to catechism. I was going to go to religious education class with my friends, which was after school. And I was going to find out where this hateful teaching came from. I thought it was a translation error. Because in Hebrew school in the next town, we were learning Hebrew. Nobody told me the New Testament was written in Greek. Plus, I'm seven years old. I had fabulous parents. My mother said to me, as long as you remember who you are, you're a little Jewish girl, go, you might learn something. It's good to know about other people's religious traditions. And the good sisters and the lay people who were teaching catechism were delighted that I was there because I think I was the only kid who wanted to be in catechism two days a week after school. And what happened was I fell in love with the stories because the stories that I heard were stories basically that I was hearing in synagogue. Jesus meets a woman at a well when they talk about marriage. That's the gospel of John chapter four, but it's Abraham's servant and Rebecca and it's Jacob and Rachel and it's Moses and Zipporah. It's like where you went. Jesus tells parables, but the prophet Nathan tells the parable of the ewe lamb to King David following that mess with Bathsheba. Uh, there are parables in the book of Samuel. There are parables in the book of Judges. And rabbinic literature, the rabbis, were they weren't just making law. They were telling fabulous stories. Jesus produces food miraculously. He heals. He raises the dead. So does the prophet Elijah. So does the prophet Elisha. And there are miracle working rabbis. 
Jesus looks just like Moses. Um, he escapes when children all around him are slaughtered. This is the gospel of Matthew. Um, he goes to Egypt like Moses went to Egypt. He crosses water in a life-changing experience. That's the baptism. He goes out into the wilderness for a multiple of 40 where he's tempted. He passes. The golden calf was not one of our better moments. And then he goes up on a mountain and he delivers the law. That's the Sermon on the Mount. The gospel of Matthew chapter two through seven is running the plot line to the book of Exodus. And even in cases where I might have heard something that might have sounded anti-Jewish, I'm not sure how, how, how attuned my anti-Jewish radar was when I was a little child. But even in some of those verses, like in the gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says, woe to you scribes and Pharisees. So we're getting to the Pharisees here uh, because you like to be greeted with honor in the marketplace and you like the best seats in the synagogue. So there was this family in my hometown synagogue. I subsequently got to know them and they're absolutely lovely people, but they always got to sit up on the bima because they were like the major donors. And my mother used to complain, right? So I'm listening to Jesus complain about other Jews. He's channeling my mother. Um, I never heard anything in catechism that struck me as anti-Jewish. And I don't think the good sisters were thinking, let's wait for the little Libyan girl to go on vacation, maybe all those Jewish holidays in the fall, and then we'll do all the bad Jew stuff. I just don't think they read the text that way. So I'm fine until I actually sat down and read the New Testament. And then I realized that there were problems. The so-called blood cry in Matthew 27, 25, his blood be on us and on our children. What the people of Jerusalem say when they're clamoring for Jesus to be crucified. It's the interpretation of this verse that Nostra Aetate, that Vatican II document, corrected. Or John chapter eight, where Jesus says to the Jews, the Greek term is eudaioi, you are from your father, the devil. I have twice been asked, both in Protestant churches, uh, when I had my horns removed by sweet Protestant ladies who thought that Jews had horns. They were delighted to find out that we didn't. Part of that idea comes from Michelangelo's statue of Moses, but part of it comes from the idea that Jews really are somehow biologically related to the devil. In Acts chapter three, Peter preaches men Israelites, which is Greek for y'all Jews, you killed the author of life. Paul in 1 Thessalonians talks about the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus. And the book of Revelation actually mentions the synagogue of Satan. And the weird thing here is the, God, the, the book of Revelation, John describes the synagogue of Satan as those who say they're Jews, but they're not. They're not even Jews. They're Gentiles who are following Jewish practice. But somehow synagogue of Satan gets tagged on to real Jews. So I realized that the New Testament can lead one to become anti-Semitic. However, I knew from what I was learning in catechism and from all those years of being around Roman Catholics that you don't have to read the New Testament anti-Jewishly. I didn't have the language for it then. The technical term is hermeneutics. It's the art of interpretation. So I knew that the text could be interpreted anti-Jewishly, but I also knew Catholics who did not interpret it that way. And I thought to myself, if anybody will teach me what that mechanism is so that we read our text with grace and love and compassion rather than with hatred, I want to know how to teach that so I can teach other people not to read their texts as a way to defame others. Is the New Testament anti-Jewish? That question is never going to be resolved. Some people think it is, and some people are convinced that it is not. It is nevertheless the case that it has been interpreted in an anti-Jewish manner. And that's where education comes from, to avoid the preaching of hate, and hence the term hermeneutics. Um, I'm a language geek. Hermeneutics comes from the Greek god Hermes, the interpreter god who goes between Mount Olympus and Earth. The New Testament is, and this is important for Jews, part of Jewish history. The first person in literature ever identified as a rabbi is Jesus of Nazareth, first time in literature. The only Pharisee from whom we have written records is Paul of Tarsus. And he, by the way, thinks being a Pharisee is absolutely splendid. The Gospels are great resources for reconstructing the lives of Jewish women in the first century CE. That's my feminism coming through. And the New Testament actually helps us fill in the gaps in our own history between the Maccabees, the Hanukkah story in the 160s BCE, the 160s before Jesus, and the Mishnah, the first rabbinic text written down about the year 200 CE. So as an historian, I look to the New Testament to use it to fill in gaps in my own Jewish history. So let's now talk about, you know, now you know what my biases are. I'm interested in filling in the gaps in Jewish history, and I don't want Jews and Christians to bear false witness against each other. All right, so here's practice. So practice on a very practical level. 
Jesus wore tzitzit, or if you're old Ashkenaz, tzitzit. These are the fringes that the book of Numbers says that Jews are supposed to put on the corners of their garments to remind them of Torah. They're kind of like WWJD bracelets for Jews. This, by the way, is a piece of first century textile. I think it's so cool that we still have stuff like this. Gospel of Matthew. Suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages, probably vaginal or uterine, touched the fringe of his cloak and boom, she's healed. She violates no law, by the way, by being outside when, she, when she's in a state of ritual impurity. Most Jews are in a state of ritual impurity most of the time, and most don't care. Matthew tells us that the crowds begged him that might, they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, his seat seat. In Matthew 23, which has a number of invectives against scribes and Pharisees, you've already heard the one about wanting the best seats in the synagogues, Matthew complains that the scribes and Pharisees make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. So you can imagine that Jesus' fringes are probably short and stubby. He's not showy about it. Um, and his phylacteries aren't so broad. Um, in terms of fringes, you can see them on a prayer shawl today that's up in the top. And for Orthodox Jewish men, you can see them sometimes just kind of hanging out. It looks like they're hanging out through the belt line. Um, it's from a type of undershirt. And as I mentioned, this comes from the book of Numbers. Speak to the Israelites and tell them to make fringes on the corners of their garments. The very fact that Jesus wears these fringes shows his investment. Um, it's like wearing it on a sleeve, as it were, shows his investment in the mitzvot the commandments. Um, this is what he continues to do. These are phylacteries, also known as tefillin. Um, when Deuteronomy says, bind them as a sign of fine upon your hand and fix them as an emblem, earlier translations read frontlets on your forehead. And you can see hints of this concern for tefillin. They're, they're kind of like prayer tools. Um, when my friends who are Catholics ask me about, you know, what is, it's kind of like having a rosary. Um, it's not quite the same thing as that you're not counting beads but it's a sense of something that you can actually wear or hold on to, which makes your prayer life a little bit richer. In terms of Jewish piety, Jesus gives us what's sometimes called the golden rule in the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter five through seven. Toward the end of the sermon, Jesus says, in everything do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. It doesn't mean it's all that there is, but it means this is the touchstone so that when you're trying to figure out how to practice the other 612 commandments, as it were, you figure out, does it fit what you would want somebody to do to you? We have a similar statement in the book of Tobit, which is in the Catholic canon, but not in the Jewish canon. If you've never read the book of Tobit, by the way, go read it. It's fabulous. This is where I have canon envy. There's an angel in disguise, a lovesick demon, and a magical fish, and Catholics get to have this in their canon. Here's Hillel, Rabbi Hillel, who is known for saying lots of wise things. Here's another one of them. If I am not for myself, who am I? And if not now, when? Which is a really good question when you're talking about getting your papers in. In the Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Shabbat 31a, we have what's sometimes called the silver rule. Jews didn't come up with these labels, by the way. Um, and sometimes called al-regelachat. Al-regelachat is Hebrew for on one foot. Uh, my friend Rabbi Dennis Sasso suggested to me that this might actually be a Latin pun because al regel sounds like regula, al regula hat sounds like regula, and regula is Latin for one rule. So whether the question was, um, teach me your Torah, your practices, your values, your traditions, your laws, your liturgy, while standing on one foot, or by one rule, Hill manages to come up with an answer to this Gentile. He says, that which is hateful to you, don't do to anybody else. That's the entire tour. The rest is interpretation. Go and learn. Um, I put in blue the Hebrew word chaver here. That means a companion. But the word I put in yellow, which is going to get us back to Pharisees, is perusha. This is Aramaic. Perusha means interpretation. So for people who think that the word Pharisee means to separate, it may not. It may be that the Pharisees are the ones who interpret. We'll speak a little bit more about the question of etymology and who the Pharisees are later. By the way, both the golden rule and the silver rule have problems. Do unto others has sometimes been used to impose one's will on other people as if, well, I would want everybody to be Christian and therefore I'm going to force people to listen to sermons and force them to be baptized and remove them from their homes and, and put them in special schools. So do unto others can actually be oppressive if that's all that we look at. And that's why it's important to note that Jesus is not saying this is the only thing we follow, but one of many.
And what is hateful to you can put you in the negative. It can stop the proactive thing. So it's like do no harm, but it's not necessarily do the good. And that's why when we look at epitomizing laws, summarizing laws, it's important not to stop there, but then to look on to the rest. All the rest is commentary, go and learn. The Sermon on the Mount is not just one verse, it's three chapters. Later on in the gospels, here again, I'm in Matthew, um, Jesus gets asked, this time actually by a Pharisee, um, which commandment in the law is the greatest? And Jesus comes up with exactly the right answer. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Um, any Jew who's ever gone to synagogue will know this. I mean, this comes off my lips as easily as the Our Father would come off the lips of Catholics. And he adds a second, Leviticus 19, 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The great Rabbi Akiva, who lived about a century after Jesus, also put to death by the Romans, part of what sometimes looked at as the Pharisaic tradition, says, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the major principle in Torah. So when it comes to the major commandments, the golden ruler, the silver rule, love of God and love of neighbor, Jesus, in terms of practice and piety, is right in line with pretty much all of his fellow Jews. When we get to the Our Father prayer, as noted, this is a perfectly good Jewish prayer. The New Testament is written in Greek. Jesus probably would have taught it in Aramaic, although we have some indication that Hebrew was having a bit of a renaissance in the late Second Temple period. He would have begun with the term Avinu in Hebrew or Urbuna in Aramaic, which means our father. And we have to take that hour very seriously. In Luke's version of the prayer, the hour drops out and it's just father. But Matthew, which has a more Jewish um, flavor to it, has that communitarian identification because Jews are a communitarian people. Um, if one person sins, the entire community is affected. If one person does something terrific, the entire community benefits. To this day, when we pray, we pray in the plural, and there are some prayers that we can only say with a quorum of 10. On Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, we atone in the plural. Forgive us our sins, or as Jesus would put it, forgive us our trespasses. Um, the Hebrew, our Father who is in heaven, Avinu Sheba Shemayim which is a, a good Jewish liturgical formulation. It's actually the beginning of the Hebrew version of the prayer for the state of Israel. Well, sometimes my Christian friends say that Jesus invented the idea of calling God Father because in Second Temple Judaism, God had become distant from transcendent and Jesus invents this Abba Daddy God. No, it turns out that Jews have been calling God Father since before the time of Jesus, during the time of Jesus, and after the time of Jesus. Back in the 1950s, there was a German scholar named Joachim Jeremias, with two J's, um, who wrote on Abba. And he said that Abba meant something like daddy and that Jews would have found calling God Abba to be blasphemous. Well, it turns out that's not true. And another biblical scholar named James Barr, a brilliant Hebraist from Scotland, actually wrote an article with the clever title of Abba Isn't Daddy, in which he proved that Abba does not mean daddy, it means father. And we can see that concern for fatherhood of, the, of God in the prophet Malachi, who says, have we not all one father, Av Echad? Uh, we can see it in the Mishnah, Rabbi Akiva. Happy are you, O Israel, before whom are you made clean? And who is it that makes you clean? It is your father who is in heaven. There's a Talmudic example of the use of the term Abba, which is not, by the way, in the Our Father prayer at all. It shows up once in the Gospels, in the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus in Gethsemane, and we're coming up toward Holy Week, Jesus in Gethsemane prays, Abba, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me, but not your will, but not my will, but your will be done, because Jesus doesn't want to die. Um, so here we have another use of Abba. This is from the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, this is a, about Hanan Hanegba, um, who was the grandson of a fellow called Honi the Circle Drawer. If you ever take a course in New Testament studies, you'll probably meet Honi. He's a miracle worker. He apparently runs in the family. When the world was in need of rain, the sages, the Chachamim, would send school children to him, and they would grab his cloak, and they would say to him, Abba, Abba, make it rain. And then Hanan Hanegba would plead before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the universe, act on behalf of these children who cannot distinguish between their Abba in heaven who can provide rain and an Abba who cannot provide rain. So even the use of the term Abba for God makes sense in a first century Jewish context. This business about who art in heaven, um, if anybody's still praying with art rather than Al, get rid of the art. That's the King James version. 
Um, at the time the King James Version was produced in the 16th century, everybody used thou and thy in art. We don't use that anymore. It creates a distance. I don't say to my husband, wouldst thou please pass thy butter, right? I mean, it's dumb. Um, the prayer is designed to be, when you talk to your dad, you can talk to your dad like it's your dad, and you don't have to be on a special level of formality. But this idea of who is in heaven actually makes sense. Because the Roman Senate awarded Julius Caesar the title of patri, pater patriae, good Latin for father of the fatherland. Ovid, the Latin poet, in his Metamorphosis, says about the Emperor Augustus, you bear on earth the name which Jupiter bears in the high heaven of men. You are the father, he of the gods. Augustus loved to be called father. It was one of his favorite titles, along with God, son of God and savior. Other emperors who took the title father, Caligula and Nero, not some of Rome's better efforts. So when Jesus and his fellow Jews pray to Avinu Sheba Shemayim, our father, the one who is in heaven, they're actually making a political statement. Our father's not the one sitting on the throne of the empire. In terms of hallowed be your name, well, that's what the Psalms do. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. The Midrash on Psalm 25, 13, may his great name grow exalted and glorified. The Kaddish prayer, most notably known for the prayer that said uh, on the occasion of a person's death or the anniversary of a person's death, but it's also a prayer that marks the different parts of, of a Jewish worship service, begins yit gadal v'yit gadash may rabah, magnified yit gadal and sanctified yit kadash, sanctified as hallowed, be God's great name, Shemei Rabbah. And the cool thing here is that the Kaddish prayer is actually in Aramaic. Jews have been hallowing God's name since Moses met a bush that was burning, and they chat. And it turns out the bush is God. Um, and God says to Moses, you know, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses doesn't want the job because nobody really wants to be a prophet. And, and when he's trying to get out of it, Moses says to God, listen, I'm paraphrasing just slightly. It's been 400 years and we've been in slavery and now we've got a problem of genocide. And where have you been, by the way? So when I go to tell the people, God is setting you free, what's your name? And if God had said, you know, my name is Matthew or my name is Susan, everything would have been fine. Except God says, Ehia asher ehia, I will be what I will be. God's name is an imperfect, irregular verb. It can't be pronounced. It is technically ineffable. And that's one way you hallow the name of God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Well, how do you know how to bring about God's will? You look in the Torah. And that's what Jesus did. Um, this passage right here from Luke chapter 10 is part of the run-up of the parable of the Good Samaritan. When a lawyer stands up to test Jesus, it's a snarky test because he, he already knows what the answer is. He says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, good Jewish teacher, turns the question back on him. My rabbi does this all the time. He answers the question with a question. It's sometimes called the Socratic method, but Socrates got it from the Jews. So Jesus says to him, what is written in the law, by which he means the Torah, what do you read there? Now, this is actually a Torah scroll being read. The silver thing in this person's hand is called a yad, which means hand. And at the top of it is actually a little finger that's pointing because you don't want to touch the Torah uh, with your finger because you don't want to get like skin oil on it. So you use this little yad to read it. Whenever you read Torah, whenever you read anything, there's always an active interpretation because you have to turn the dots and dashes on the page into words, and then you have to figure out how the words make sense. And Torah reading is especially an active interpretation because Torah scrolls from antiquity to today have no vowels. So you have to interpret it. And that's what Jesus does. In terms of give us this day our daily bread, um, the problem here, ton our ton hemon is our day, ton epiusion, I'm reading the Greek here, and the thing in, in yellow is epiusion. That's the problem because we don't know what it means. And if you just think about this prayer, I mean, just take a moment to think about it. Give us this day our daily bread is redundant. It's like saying hot water heater. Now work on that for a minute. If it's give us this day our bread, it makes sense. If it's give us our daily bread, that makes sense. But give us this day our daily bread is an extra word. And the problem is this term translated daily epiusion. We actually don't know what it means. But if you retroject it into Aramaic, you make it something that looks like for tomorrow or for the future. As if perhaps the prayer in Aramaic said something along the lines of give us tomorrow's bread today. That would make a huge amount of sense in first century Judaism. Why? Because one major image that Jews had of the world to come, the olam haba, the world to come, or in Jesus' language, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, it's a giant banquet 
where everybody reclines at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So maybe it's like, bring about that messianic banquet today. That's why when you read your way through the gospels at the end, you should get hungry because after a 40 day fast, pretty much the only thing Jesus does up until the last supper is eat. And he eats indiscriminately. He eats with Pharisees. He eats with sinners and tax collectors. He feeds 5,000 people on a mountainside. In fact, according to Matthew, it's 5,000 people, not including the women and the children. So he got shortchanged. It's probably like 35,000 people. And the reason he's doing this is because he's enacting that messianic banquet so that when you eat in his presence, it is as if you already have one foot in the kingdom of heaven. But there's also a relation to this idea of manna in the wilderness where God provides food. And there's also a concern to feed others because it would be hypocritical to pray for our daily bread and not give what we have to people who are, who are in need. Forgive us our debts. That's Matthew. Luke is forgive us our trespasses. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when I am in church, and I'm in church very often on a Sunday morning, I have to figure out which church I'm in to know whether the church is asking for forgiving debts or forgiving trespasses. In Aramaic, they mean the same thing. The Aramaic word hov, which Jesus probably used, can mean sin, it can mean debt, or it can mean trespass. But all translators are traitors. And whereas that one word in Aramaic can mean all these different things, in Greek, sin does not necessarily mean debt, and debt does not necessarily mean sin. So what is, what is being asked here? Well, people in the first century, and even before that, had to figure out how to describe sin, because sin has a thingness to it. Sin is not just an abstract category. Sin is a thing. So they needed metaphors to talk about it. So sin could be um, sin could be a stain that needed to be washed off. So here's the sheet music. Um, are you washed in the blood of the lamb? Uh, sin could be a burden that, that can be lifted off. And people who are forgiven can actually stand up straighter because they don't feel that, that guilt anymore. And when we start with the book of Tobit, that wonderful book in the Deuterocanonical collection, Tobit describes sin as a debt, as if we all have these heavenly treasure boxes, and ever we sin, we draw down against our account. When Jesus says in Matthew and Mark that he is dying as a ransom for many, that metaphor fits because what he's doing is he's refilling those treasure boxes that had been depleted by sin. He's, in effect, resetting the accounts. So forgive us our sins, as Luke would have it as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. So I, this raises the question, what's easier to forgive a sin or a debt? I'll just go back to this for one, one part. Um, I, I've been teaching, uh, well, I had been teaching until COVID at a maximum security institute here in Nashville, Riverbend maximum, maximum Security Institute, which is where Tennessee's death row is located because Tennessee still kills people. And I would bring Vanderbilt Divinity students out to the prison and we would meet with insider students. Um, and at one point, we're, when we're doing the Gospel of Matthew, which is the text that talks about visiting people in prison, Matthew 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jews, by the way, if you get to heaven and there's a sheep line and a goat line, get into the sheep line. Don't ask, just get into the sheep line. You'll be fine. Um, I, I made the argument that I thought it was easier to forgive a sin than a debt. Because if you sin against me, I can forgive you. But if you owe me $100,000 and I've got two kids to put through university in 2022, I want the money. And one of my insider students who had been going through a program of victim offender mediation where he met weekly with family members of the people he killed, this was a drug deal that went really, really wrong, looked at me and he said, lady, you don't have a clue. And then he explained about how this family had said to him after a year of meeting together, um, we're not angry with you anymore. We don't hate you. We don't think you're a demon. We recognize the sorrow that you have. Uh, we forgive you. And then he looked at me and he said, lady, your problem is that you do not understand sin. And because you do not understand sin, you do not understand forgiveness. And what they had offered him in forgiving his sin was worth more than any economic debt could ever be worth. And I thought, my gosh, that's absolutely right. So what did Jesus actually say? I think he punned. I think for people who had resources, Jesus is very interested in paying it forward. You forgive their debts, and ideally those people will then forgive the debts of other people in the community. And people who are burdened by sin, that's something they would have to address as well. Rescue us or deliver us from evil or from the evil one. The Greek is hoponeros. And you could take it as an abstract category, or you could say rescue us from Satan because Satan was having a very, very robust time in Second Temple Judaism. 
So why does Satan remain in parts of the Christian tradition? You can see this very, very clearly, for example, in Dante's Inferno, where you have Satan in the pit of hell. Um, and why does Satan kind of drop out of Judaism? Because as church and synagogue began to separate, the church became more concerned about heaven and hell, and consequently about Satan, and more concerned about salvation. And the more the church talked about salvation, what happens after we die, the more Jews started talking about sanctification in this life. So whereas all Jews, or pretty much all Jews, were interested in questions of Satan and what happened after we died in the first century, as time moved on, part of that separation between church and synagogue, some stuff became more important in the church and other stuff became more important in the synagogue. And here we have that what is easier to forgive a sin or a debt, something worth thinking about. Now to Pharisees. So this is a, that's Pope Francis in the white. You're not allowed to wear white when you meet with him, by the way, unless you're a bride or a reigning Catholic queen, I asked. Um, we had a conference in 2019 on the Pharisees. Um, uh, I'm there uh, about five people in on the right. That's me. Standing next to me is Rabbi Abraham Skorka, the Pope's rabbi. Um, uh, on the other side of the Pope, on the left, the very tall person there, that's Christian Stuckel, who's the director of the Omer, Ober Ammergau Passion Play. The Pontifical Biblical Institute convened a conference, international conference on the Pharisees. Uh, so we got a papal audience, which was absolutely fabulous. Uh, the Pope has to give an address. This is me and Mark Brettler, by the way, meeting the Pope in St. Peter's Square. Um, the Pope has to give an address because when you have an audience with the Pope, the Pope gives an address. Now, it turns out the Pope doesn't actually write his address. The people who put the audience together, the conveners, write the address, and then the Vatican decides what they'll say and what they'll not say. Um, so I and Professor Joseph Sievers and Professor Craig Morrison helped draft the Pope's talk, which, as my husband said, made me the Holy Ghost writer, which I want to hang on to. And here's what the Pope says, and this is on the Vatican website, and it's also on the book in the Pharisees. Among Christians and in secular society, in different languages, the word Pharisee often means a self-righteous or hypocritical person. For many Jews, however, the Pharisees are the founders of rabbinic Judaism, and hence their own spiritual forebears. So the Pope goes on to say one of the most ancient and most damaging stereotypes is that of a Pharisee, especially when used to cast Jews in a negative light. And ideally, this statement will change Catholic teachings because I'm still reading Catholic materials, most recently in the National Catholic Reporter with letters to the editor of Catholics using Pharisees in a negative way. And I'm hoping the Pope's statement will have a, a comparable effect to Nostra Aetate and Catholics will be able to watch their language a little bit more. The Holy See has had various statements on how to deal with Jews and Judaism, as I mentioned, Roman Catholics are ahead of the curve in trying to end the teachings of contempt. Um, in 1974, that early, the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews wrote, the Old Testament and the Jewish tradition founded upon it must not be set against the New Testament such a, in such a way that the former seems to con constitute a religion of only justice, fear, and legalism with no appeal to the love of God and neighbor. But we see that they weren't up, up to speed on Pharisees um, they only note Pharisees once at the end of a footnote on how Pharisee and Phariseeism have taken on a largely pejorative meaning, but they didn't make that next step and say, stop using it in that way. You move up to the next decade, um, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, a wonderful statement, God's mercy endures forever, notes that many of the New Testament texts, such as Matthew's references to hypocrites in the synagogue, that's the Ash Wednesday reading, John's depiction of Jesus in the temple, cycle B, third Sunday of Lent, uh, and Jesus' conflicts with the Pharisees, Luke cycle C, fourth Sunday, can give the impression that the Judaism of Jesus' day was devoid of spiritual depth and essentially at odds with Jesus' teaching, right? And the bishops are right. If I were a Catholic bishop, and, and feel free to make me one bishop, you know, because you're there and you have power, I would make a fabulous bishop, by the way, and the rings are beautiful. I would begin by changing the lectionary. So what do we do since the lectionary is not about to be changed? We try to avoid the stereotypes that have been imposed on who the Pharisees were. They were not legalistic. They were not elite. They were not money loving. They were not xenophobic. They didn't hate foreigners. They were not misogynist. In fact, they had women patrons. They were not hypocrites any more in any, or any less than any other group. And they were actually not resistant to innovation. So they should not be stand-ins for any policy that we do not like. So here's just one example of somebody who got the Pharisees wrong. 
And I cite Brian McLaren. Um, he is a fairly prominent evangelical and he writes really, really, really good stuff. And I use his example just to show how hardwired some of this stuff is. This showed up in an evangelical journal called Sojourners, um, where McLaren described Pharisees as rich and successful people who lived in fancy houses and stepped over their destitute neighbors. Um, they were people who judged, insulted, excluded, avoided, and accused others. And who would be saved? The very people whom the Pharisees despised, deprived, avoided, excluded, and condemned. Heaven's gates opened wide for the poor and the destitute, the sinners, the tax collectors, the homeless, even the prostitutes, right? In other words, all the people the Pharisees were careful to avoid were exactly the ones who would someday be welcomed into heaven. And here's where he really gets it wrong. Imagine how this overturning of traditional language of hell must have shocked everyone, multitudes and Pharisees alike. And by this statement, he winds up giving readers of this journal the impression that pretty much everybody, because that's who the multitudes are, all Jews thought that the only people who would go in, who would go to heaven would be the wealthy and the healthy. And that's not what Judaism teaches by a long shot. Now, the good result here was that a number of people wrote to Sojourners and said, I think this is a mischaracterization of Judaism. And Jim Wallace, the editor of Sojourners, wrote to me and said, in effect, can you fix this? Because he's a friend. And I said, sure. Um, and I wrote a letter. I wrote an article designed to fix this. But it turned out about 10 years before Sojourners had produced another problematic essay on the Pharisees. And they asked some other Jew to fix it. This just shows how hardwired this language is. And here's why we have to work on it. We don't know what the word Pharisee mean. It, could, it can mean to separate, but we don't know from what. To sin from impurity, from what is not holy. But as we've seen, it can also mean to interpret or to explain or to specify. The Peshitta, the Syriac, which is very close to Aramaic, means distinction or explanation. This is my friend, Craig Morrison. Um, he's a Carmelite uh, who teaches at the Biblicum. And he has this wonderful article in this volume on Pharisees called Interpreting the Name Pharisee. And he also notes that it's very problematic to define someone based on the origi origin of a name or, uh, as opposed to based on what we know about them. The term Protestant was not originally used by Protestants. It was used by Roman Catholics to talk about people who were rejecting certain Catholic doctrine. And particular groups may, may have a particular name, but the name may not have carried through Quite as, quite as much as who that group is because groups change identity over time. Pharisees are not rabbis, but there's a strong connection to them. And here's what we know. Pharisees were less the conservative preservers of the status quo. They're more countercultural teachers and creative innovators who make the law less lenient. The Dead Sea Scrolls refer to them as seekers after smooth things. They make things easier. Pharisaic law, Pharisaic halakha, authorized a lenient human agency, and it actually undermined priestly views of purity and holiness. On the other hand, Jesus sometimes sides with the less lenient, less compromising Sadducees, for example, on divorce. So if you want an example of Pharisees, Mark gives us this, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands. Who knew under COVID, it turned out the Pharisees were right. So why did they do this? Um, because the Pharisees took Exodus 19.6 very seriously. Exodus 19.6, pro God proclaims through Moses, you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the Israelites. So what the Pharisees are doing is interested in taking the practices that are in the temple, which signified holiness, sacrality, and moving those practices out from the temple, out from just the priests in the temple to everybody, so that your own table, your own dinner, could be as if you too are sharing a meal with God, as if you were participating in the sacrifices in the temple. The priests would wash their hands before they came to the elements. Who knew? That's a tradition preserved by the church. And here you can see a Roman Catholic priest with the hand washing. This is done for purity reasons, ritual purity, because if it were done for hygiene, you'd be using Purell. So this is a ritual purity model. Um, what we have down below is, is a laver, a washer, that's used when Jews, uh, for traditional Jews who will wash their hands before they eat, and they say a prayer, uh, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, uh, who has sanctified us and has given us the commandment concerning nitilat yadayim, concerning the washing of the hands. 
In terms of model Pharisees, there are a lot of them and they're named. In fact, every single name Pharisee we have um, turns out to be absolutely splendid. One of whom named Eliezer actually juggles. He's spectacular. In the book of Acts, there's a fellow named Gamaliel, who's Paul teachers, uh, Paul's teacher. Uh, in the Gospel of John, there's a fellow named Nicodemus. This is he in an icon um, who shows up in John 3 and John 7. He helps bury the body of Jesus in John 19. And of course, Paul is a Pharisee. Um, and as my colleague Joseph Sievers wrote in a very famous article called Who Were the Pharisees? Not one of the dozen or so named Pharisees in ancient texts fits any of the negative stereotypes. In terms of Paul, Paul boasts about being a Pharisee. Now, Paul says he's not boasting, but he is. Even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone has reason to be confident, I've got more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, and none of this goes away. Paul does not cease being a Pharisee. We can see that in the book of Acts. He just becomes, in his view, like a better Pharisee than as to zeal a persecutor of the church, but as to righteousness under the law, blameless or faultless, a memtos. So when my Christian friends say to me, oh, you can't follow the law. Well, Paul did, and he wasn't the only one. And if you mess up, it's okay, because Judaism has multiple mechanisms for atonement. When Paul talks about Torah, the Torah is holy and the commandments are holy and just and good. Paul is not doing away with Torah at all. Paul is not against Torah. What he is against is Gentiles following Torah. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. That's his title. And in his view, what will happen in the Messianic age is that the Gentiles will turn from their pagan gods to worship the God of Israel, but they don't say, oh, well, now circumcise me. They don't become Jews because if they became Jews, then the only people who would be worshiping God in the Messianic age would be Jews. But the Messianic age is the time when Jews and Gentiles together as equals worship God. In terms of Pharisees and recep reception history, what happens in the church fathers is that Pharisees stand in for different theological views, usually heretical, with no connection to actual Pharisees. It wasn't until Yosipon, which is a medieval version of the works of Josephus, um, that the sages of Israel, the rabbis from the Mishnah and the Talmud, start getting identified with Pharisees because rabbinic literature does not actually make this connection. But because of this medieval connection between the rabbis of the Mishnah and Talmud and the Pharisees, that's why pretty much all Jews today look at the Pharisees as our spiritual forebears. And it's not necessarily the case that everybody in the Middle Ages looked at Pharisees negatively. Christian artists such as Michelangelo and Caravaggio depict Nicodemus sympathetically, and Rembrandt actually depicts dignified Pharisees in the story of the woman taken in adultery. If you want more about Pharisees, here's the book. We wanted a red cover. Um, and we've got everything from the etymology of the name to what we know about Jewish purity practices in the late Second Temple period, period to what the Dead Sea Scrolls say, what Josephus says, what Paul says, what the Gospels say. Um, what rabbinic literature suggests about what Pharisees are doing based on how we understand Pharisees from these other early sources, um, Pharisees and early Christian uh, fathers, um, Pharisees in the medieval Jewish sages, in Martin Luther and John Calvin in art, the changing portrayal of the Pharisees in the Ober Amergau Passion Play. They're so fabulous right now, I would let my children date them. How Pharisees show up on film, Pharisees in modern scholarship how Pharisee, Pharisees show up in Catholic textbooks, a wonderful article by Phil Cunningham from St. Joseph's University, preaching and teaching the Pharisees and what about the future? And it ends with the address of Pope Francis. And finally, we move to parable. Parable is a Greek term. Para, you know, for to set side by side, like a paralegal or a paramedic. And balo means to cast or to throw. So ekbalo means to cast somebody out, like you ekbalo a demon, that's exorcism. Parabolo is you set two things next to each other, and in that juxtaposition, you see something new. The closest Hebrew term for this would be mashal, which is basically a wisdom saying. Um, parables are frequently today in churches looked at as children's stories, and they can be, but they weren't originally told that way. So if you settle for an easy answer, like this means we should take care of people who are injured by the side of the road, or for the recent lectionary reading of the prodigal son, God loves us even if we screw up big time. That's an insufficient answer. It's a good answer, but it's insufficient answer. 
So when you read a parable, here's just a quick trot on how you do it. It's a comparison to reality. The kingdom of heaven is like something. Uh, multiple interpretations are possible because the, ferris, the parables are completely open-ended, which is why homilies on the same parable every year can be slightly different. There are often connections to the scriptures of Israel. So if you begin a parable, there was a father who had two sons. Every Jew knows the plot line because that's Cain and Abel and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau. Uh, parables generally challenge or indict or provoke. There's an old saying about religion that religion is designed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Think about parables as doing a lot of the afflicting. They need to make sense in their own historical context. Parables are not anti-Jewish, um, but we, we have to know that historical context as well. So let's go to the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. There are lots of cartoons about these. Pharisees always show up as chubby, by the way. I'm not quite sure why. And they're always wearing calluses on their head. And I don't know why they're doing that either. Um, but at least they've got sandals on. That would have made sense. Um, in Luke chapter 8, verses 9 through 14, we have what is generally called the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. In Jesus' own historical context, the Pharisee would have been seen as righteous and respected. In Luke's narrative context, Pharisees are hypocritical and sanctimonious. In his own historical context, the tax collector would have been seen as a collaborationist. He works for Rome, likely dishonest, likely to overcharge the population. And thus, thus John the Baptist tells tax collectors coming out to him, don't take any more than the amount that's due to you. Uh, according to Luke, tax collectors were rich, well-connected, and ostentation, ostentatious enough to hold banquets, and they're friends of sinners. So in their own historical context, think of tax collectors and sinners not as the poor and the marginalized. Tax collectors and sinners are arms dealers, drug traders, sex traffickers, and politicians you don't like. In Luke, the tax collector is a humble, justified hero. And this is why it's important to try to see how these figures function not only in the Gospel of Luke, but how they might have been understood when Jesus first told this parable. Here's the parable. It starts, two people went up to the temple to pray. You always go up to the temple, by the way, in the same way you go up to Jerusalem. You could be on the moon. You go up to the temple. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And Luke has offered us numerous unlikable Pharisees. They usually host Jesus for dinner, and then he tells them what they, does, what they do wrong. And lots of darling tax collectors. They come to John for baptism. They listen to Jesus. They throw him dinner parties. A tax collector becomes one of Jesus' apostles. Uh, and shortly, we will meet a chief tax collector named Zacchaeus, which is basically Mr. Righteous, um, who climbs up a sycamore tree, so he's athletic. Um, he also becomes Jesus' host. Interpretations of this parable typically give us the anti-Jewish reading. So St. Augustine, or if you're in Florida, I guess St. Augustine, the Pharisee is the unsaved Jew, and the tax collector, the publican, is a saved Gentile Christian. So you can begin to see how this dualism, this separation between Judaism and Christianity, tends to impose on the New Testament very anti-Jewish readings that are not part of the original. As a contemporary popular reading, this book has sold multiple copies. Um, you might be a Pharisee if... Uh, where the Pharisee represents whatever population the homilist seeks to be, sees to be judgmental, parochial, bigoted, stuck in the mud, or otherwise unable to see the newness of the good news as the homilist understands it, and the tax collector represents us righteous Christians. Eh, not so good. Uh, we also have a problem with translation. Now, whenever we translate, we've always got problems because words always take on new meanings and they drop out. So here are just a couple of different translations that we have. The Pharisee took up his position, right, as if he's got a pedestal, and he spoke this prayer to himself. Or how about the Pharisee standing by himself was praying? That's a little bit more neutral. The Pharisee prayed thus within himself. Or how about the Pharisee was praying about himself? Well, the proseo tone can be any of this, but I see no reason to take this up as to say the Pharisee is praying to himself. The Pharisee is praying to God because he begins, oh God. And here's what he says. I give thanks to you that I am not like the rest of people. Okay, it's not a great prayer. Greedy, unrighteous, adulterous, or even like that their tax collector. I fast two times a week right? on the Sabbath. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of whatever I acquire. And then I went to look, because I wrote a book on parables of what the Pharisee is saying, and commentators call him disingenuous, self-deceptive, and mean-spirited. Some claim that the Pharisee implicitly considers himself an autonomous agent of moral virtue. He is hardly dependent upon God for anything. 
So the commentators go out of their way to make the Pharisee look worse than he does. When I hear the Pharisee say, I give thanks to you, God, that I am not like an adulterer or I am not like a tax collector. That's sometimes what I feel when I'm leaving Riverbend Maximum Security Prison and the gates of the prison close behind me and I'm driving out of the prison with that damn spotlight that hits the rearview mirror. So you have to drive really, really slowly. And sometimes I'm thinking, thank you, God, that I didn't grow up in a house that had a gun in it. Thank you, God, that I grew up in a stable household uh, that didn't suffer poverty. Thank you, God, that I'm not a sociopath. Like there, but for the grace of God, go I. The Pharisee, and here's his prayer again, thanks God and thus shows dependence. Pharisees believed in a combination of fate and free will. To, so to some extent, his moral stance is of his own doing. He did resist temptation. He chose to follow Torah. And as I noted, the first part of the prayer is another way of saying there, but for the grace of God, go I. Now, it's very common to find in the literature a comparison of the Pharisee's prayer with a prayer in the Tosefta. Uh, the first rabbinic document we have is the Mishnah. And then about 50 years later, about the year 250, we have the Tosefta, which really means additions, like the name Joseph means addition. So the Tosefta is kind of like an addition to the Mishnah. Um, this may be the only rabbinic prayer that some New Testament scholars actually know, where Rabbi Judah, who thrived about the year 200 or so, says a man must recite three benedictions every day, blessing God who did not make him a Gentile, uneducated, or a woman. It's an awful prayer, I think, but it also speaks to male Jewish responsibility. Gentiles were not under Torah, and so were not expected to follow it. Gentiles, the uneducated, were unable in Rabbi Judah's eyes, fully to understand the practices and so the rationales. And women were exempt in the rabbinic system from many time-bound commandments, since the rabbis realized that their time was not their own, like the duties of childcare. So is it a great prayer? No. When my son Alexander was going to the Akiva school, the Orthodox Jewish day school in Nashville, and came home with the Shiloh Asani, who did not make me prayer, and he recited it for me. And I said to him, he must have been about five, I said, Alexander, mummy's a woman and your sister Sarah is a woman. Are you saying it's not good to be a woman? And Alexander looked at me with total seriousness and said, Rabbi said that women are holier than men and therefore we have to have special responsibilities. I thought this was total nonsense, but on the lips of a five-year-old, I could deal with it. Is it a good comparison? Probably not. Why not compare this prayer with Seder Eliyahu Rabba 10? I call heaven and earth to witness whether Jew or Gentile, whether man or woman, whether servant or free, they are all equal in this, that the Holy Spirit rests on them in accordance with their deeds. A much better comparison. The Pharisee, by the way, is a caricature. No one was required that everything be tithed. Abraham did it once, but Abraham is an exceptional case. And no one required twice a week fasting. So he's a caricature. So may the tax collector be. Standing at a distance, he did not wish to raise his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast. This is still done on Yom Kippur, right? When you recite the litany of sins. And he says, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So then we get the commentators who come in and commentators say things like, he was most likely ostracized by other worshipers because of his suspected ritual impurity. Whenever Christians start talking about ritual impurity, they typically get it wrong. The Pharisee is in the Jerusalem temple. He is not ritually impure. You can be a sinner and ritually impure, and you can be a perfectly righteous person and at that moment be ritually impure or others because the tax collector entered the homes of unclean people, touched unclean objects and handled unclean money. He would be considered ceremonially. No, his problem is not ritual purity. Um, his problem is that he's a sinner. The end of the parable reads, I tell you, this man went down to his home justified, para the other. And most translations read para as rather than, as if the tax collector is justified, put in a right relationship with God, and the Pharisee is not. So it's, it's a zero-sum game. Um, I don't think this is a particularly good translation. You can translate it like this, and you can play with, with, the, with the, um, the question of the tenses. But I don't think the parable should be setting up a bad comparison, because if you read, this one meant that went down justified rather than the other. The message is, thank God I'm not like that Pharisee over there. Thank God I don't fast. Thank God I am an adulterer. That's not helpful. Um, so there must be a better way of doing this. 
The primary reading, reading of para rather than antagonism is one of juxtaposition. So para plus the accusative can mean because of or on account of. Why don't we read the parable as I tell you this man went down to his home justified on account of the other or because of the other. And that makes sense in Judaism. Because Judaism has a teaching known as the zechut avot, the merits of the ancestors. In the same way that if one person sins, everybody in the community is impacted, as noted, if one person does something really, really well, everybody else benefits from it. Uh, since the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did stuff really, really well, we can say to God, we may be sinful, but remember what our father Abraham did when he was willing to offer his son Isaac on the altar. Remember his merits and let them accrue to us. And if you want a really good example of Jewish communal benefit, if the many die through the one man's trespass, much more surely has the grace of God and the free gift and the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. That's communal benefit. So why not read the parable in its Jewish context and see the, see the tax collector as somehow tapping into the merit of the Pharisee? Because that Pharisee has got more merit than he knows what to do with. And then we can see the temple as a place of reconciliation. We can see the merit of the Pharisee, and then we can see the responsibility of the Pharisee, because if the tax collector taps into his merit, it's the Pharisee's job then to make sure the tax collector continues on the path of repentance. We can see the responsibility of the tax collector, because it's all good to say to God in the temple, forgive me, what do you do when you leave the building? And finally, we can see the generosity, the abundant, overflowing generosity of God, who is willing to justify both. The end for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves is exalted, was just tacked onto that, that passage by Luke. It appears elsewhere, and it's actually not necessary to the parables. So where are we? To misunderstand Judaism is to misunderstand Jesus. To fail to hear Jesus as a first century Jew is to deform the gospel. We've seen the importance of Paul's role as the apostle to the Gentiles and understanding his role as the apostle to the Gentiles as how to understand his comments about Torah. And we've seen the need to stop picking on the Pharisees. So where are we? We're in the next stages of Jewish Christian relations and especially Jewish Catholic relations. We're reading scriptures together. The very fact that the Biblicum can invite me to teach a course on parables to priests, me and 40 priests, it was great. We've seen the church attending to problematic New Testament's guidelines, as we saw with the statement from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. We're seeing new statements by both groups and ongoing work to avoid anti-Jewish teaching and preaching. We're seeing new curricula at pontifical universities. Today, this afternoon, I gave a paper by Zoom for the Catholic University of Portugal that inaugurated a brand new chair of Jewish and Christian biblical studies named after Rabbi Isaac Abravanel and Dameo de Gos. And at some point I will be there in Lisbon to teach in person. And finally, what are these new stages? This program, a program that can be co-sponsored um, both by the diocese and by the university, a program that as Matthew showed us uh, can bring together Jewish congregations and Christian congregations. In fact, very conservative Protestant schools and liberal Protestant schools uh, from across the globe. This is fabulous. This is, in effect, a new dawn in Jewish Christian relations. I am honored to be a part of it, and I am happy to help you in any way that I can to further this exciting and important concern. Thank you very much. Thank you, AJ, very much for your rich presentation. And uh, we're so honored to have you with us and to, to take us along in this journey into the New Testament. It's, con it's a very rich Jewish context. Um, for those of you who are on the conference call, please feel free to begin thinking and reflecting on uh, AJ's talk and feel free to submit questions in the uh, Q&A box. I will go ahead and moderate now. And um, one of the first questions that we have um, is on, it looks like a certain translation of the New Testament, AJ. They're asking, what are your thoughts about the Jewish translation of the New Testament by Passover plot author Hugh Schoenfeld? Yes. 
when I was a child, the book, The Passover Plot, I think was in every single Jewish household. I mean, that, that was like the book to read. And it was one of the first books I read up on the New Testament. I thought, wow, could this possibly be true? Did Jesus actually not die on the cross? Wow. Um, I have never read Hugh Schoenfeld's translation. Um, I've, want, I've, I've read the one done by David Stern, um, not the David Stern who teaches at Penn, who writes on parables, but the David Stern um, who writes for Messianic Jewish organizations. Um, and I, I find it kind of funny because every, at least for David Stern's translation, every once in a while, it sounds like Jesus came from Brooklyn. Um, and there's a little bit of, of Yiddish coming through, but I understand why he does it. Um, so I can't answer your question because I haven't read that translation. I, I find all translations to be traitors. Um, I'm not happy with any of them on the market right now. I know um, uh, that there is a new translation coming out of the New American Bible Revised Edition, which is the, the American Catholic Bible. New American Bible Revised Edition is NEIGHBOR, which I think is just a great acronym. I don't like, will you read my neighbor? Um, I don't know what the new one will be called. I asked uh, members of the committee from the Catholic Biblical Association, of which I am a member, um, if I could be of any help to them, both in the translation and the notes, but alas, they did not ask me to do that. There's also a new translation of the New Revised Standard Version coming out. Um, and that should be up by the end of, of 2022. Um, they're all problematic. And the fact is that when we go back to the Greek and to the Hebrew and to the Aramaic, they're problematic too, because we don't have any of the originals. So whenever we translate, we're doing the best we can with, with imperfect copies, with copies that sometimes strategically disagree with each other. And then when it comes to questions of Jews and Judaism, um, we really have difficulties in, in terms of determining how are we going to translate this material. And I'll just give you one really good example of this. Um, in the epistle of James, whose real name is Jacob, and the Greek is Yaakov, but somehow everybody, you know, all the, all the Jacobs become Jameses, as if they all suddenly got baptized. Well, I guess maybe they did. Um, uh, it, James talks about when people come into your synagogue guy, right? When people come into your synagogues, and pretty much all English translations read, when people come into your assemblies. But that same word used in the book of Revelation, synagogos, becomes the synagogue of Satan. And it's translated synagogue when Jesus goes into synagogues or Jesus talks about uh, you will be brought and, and disciplined in their synagogues. So why does synagogue in all these English translations have generally a negative translation? Uh, but when it's related to a follower of Jesus, <clears throat> the same word comes in as assembly. That's the problem we have with questions of translation. Thank you, Amy, very much. Uh, another question we have is, how do you understand the portrayal of Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23 slash Luke 11, 37, 54? And uh, I just went to that on the NRSV and the, the title that the translators chose for that section is Jesus denounces Pharisees and lawyers. Yeah, well, okay, thank you for that. Um, the first thing we have to realize is that the original Bible text did not come with subheadings. I mean, I mean, Jesus engages with Pharisees might be a little, a little easier, but denounce is probably not a bad comment for what in fact he does. Matthew 23 has seven invectives against scribes and Pharisees, like woe to you scribes and Pharisees because you do everything wrong and then some. Um, it would not surprise me that Jesus, the historical Jesus, right, before the Gospels got a hold of him, uh, before he died, uh, the historical Jesus denounced Pharisees. The idea of Jews denouncing other Jews is part of the system. Um, you can see this with the prophets of Israel. I mean, you know, um, Jeremiah had some choice things to say about the king at the time. Amos had some very choice things to say about the rich. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls have some very choice things to say about other people who aren't part of their community. Uh, and scribes and Pharisees were not, excuse me, Sadducees and Pharisees were not the best of friends. And we can see that uh, in various places, including the book of Acts. The problem comes about when Jesus' denunciations of Pharisees are repackaged into a gospel narrative, which is then marketed toward a Gentile church. So it's originally insider discourse becomes uh, outsider discourse. I think when Jesus um, complains about the Pharisees, that they're not doing what they should be doing, I think he wants more of them. He expects more from them because they are, in fact, the popular teachers at the time. Josephus, who is a first century historian, a slightly younger contemporary of Jesus, um, he's, Josephus is a priest. And in the book on Pharisees, uh, the scholar Steve Mason, who's done more work on Pharisees recently than anybody else, and he's brilliant, uh, makes a compelling case, compelling at least to me, um, that Josephus wasn't a Pharisee, that he didn't like the Pharisees, because he thought the Pharisees were getting too much, they were, they were uppity. 
because Josephus thought that people ought to be listening to priests like him. And priesthood in Judaism is an inherited position in Judaism. If your father's a priest, you're a priest. And there's nothing you can do about it. So it's not a vocation. In Roman Catholicism, if your father's a priest, something has probably gone wrong, right? Because in the church, priesthood is a vocation. You are called to it. In Judaism, it's just an inherited position. Um, and Josephus thinks that the priests have this responsibility. They inherited the role of being teachers. And he's really upset that people are listening to the Pharisees. So the people are listening to the Pharisees and the Pharisees have some really, really good things to say, which is why Matthew 23 begins, the scribes and Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. So do what they tell you to do, uh, but don't do what they do because they preach, but don't practice, right? Um, so Jesus wants them to up their game a little bit uh, because he's holding them to a higher standard. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, still in the Gospel of Matthew, um, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And he's not setting the bar low. He's not saying you have to be better than Nazi child molesters. He's setting the bar very, very high and then saying you have to be even better than that, which is why he ends the Sermon on the Mount and says, be perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. So rival teachers. And I think part of the invective is not from Jesus himself, but comes from the hand of the people uh, who, who produce part of the oral tradition and compose the gospel. And you can see an increasing vilification of Pharisees. For example, this is probably more than you wanted, David, but here we go. Um, in the gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 12, um, Jesus is teaching in the temple and people are you know, trying to trip him up with, with difficult questions. And when a scribe listens to, hears his answers and think, you know, about, you know, should you pay taxes or whose wife is this multiply married woman in the resurrection? He thinks these are great answers. So he comes to him and says, what's the greatest commandment? Because that's a really good question. There were 613 of them. And you want to know what the more important ones are and what the less important ones are. Right? Um, and this is when Jesus says, love of God and love of neighbor, right? Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. And the scribe says, great answer. I'm paraphrasing. That's more important than, than all the sacrifices. Absolutely. Because as we know from Hosea, which Jesus quotes, God desires mercy, not sacrifice, by which he means um, God desires mercy more than he desires sacrifice. Um, either or in, in this language, in this rhetoric is rather, is, is uh, this more than that. In the gospel of Matthew, that scribe is no longer a scribe. He's a Pharisee. There's no positive appreciation of Jesus' words, and there's no approbation of the words at the end. So what Matthew has done is inserted a Pharisee and changed the form of the discourse. And I think that's the hint of Matthew seeing the Pharisees as rivals to his fledgling community and doing his best to keep followers of Jesus, both Jewish and Gentile, because Gentiles were welcome in synagogues in antiquity and today, trying to keep them out of the synagogue. I think Luke used, used Matthew as a source. Now, for anybody who's heard about something called the Q source, and I was on, I was on the Q bandwagon for a number of decades, but having written a commentary on the Gospel of Luke with my friend Ben Witherington III, who's an evangelical Methodist, um, the more convinced I became that Luke had, an, Luke had access to Matthew. What else we got? Thank you very much, Amy. We have a few more time for a few more questions here. Um, one uh, guest asks um, or says, many people in the church have uh, little knowledge of historical insights. What simplified text could you recommend for a parish to have a book study for interested learners? Well, to answer that, I have to be self-promoting, and I'm not sure whether that's a sin or not. Um, it, it, it isn't in Judaism, it may be in Catholicism, because you're more humble than I am. Um, but here we go. Um, I have been writing numerous books for Abingdon Press, which is the publication wing of the United Methodist Church, that are designed for church-based Bible study. Um, they have no footnotes, they're entirely accessible for people who don't like to read or who forgot to do the assignments. Uh, they come with streaming videos, so you can get me telling you what you should have read. And they come with leader guides uh, so that people who don't know how to run discussion sections, this gives you prayers that you can, and they're, they're Christian prayers, uh, that with which you can begin and end a section, um, and they give you discussion questions. The most recent one actually came out after Matthew wrote his introduction. Um, it's called, oh, I have it here. It's called Witness at the Cross. It's a beginner's guide to Holy Friday. So those, those would be entirely user-friendly for you. 
Um, but there are lots of really, really good resources out there. Um, you can find some of those resources, by the way, on the website of the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. Thank you very much, Amy. We have another question. Uh, this attendee writes, John 4 has a dialogue between Jesus and a Samaritan. This has sometimes been taken as an issue of racism, but it is more likely a reflection of religious difference and a checkered history between Samaritans and Jews. Since race is an ambiguous term, uh, the attendee writes, I frame this as an incident involving cultural discrimination. Do you think that description fits? That's a great question. Um, I, it's a both and rather than an either or. Um, I think it's an issue of, of religion and inter, by religion here meaning belief system or certain ritual practices. But I also think it's an ethnic issue. So it's not racial because that category doesn't work, but it is an ethnic issue. Because one of the big questions that Second Temple Jews had was, were Sadducees in or out? Because Sadducees aren't Gentiles. They worship the same God. They claim descent from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They see themselves as the remnants of the northern tribes of Israel. Um, they have basically the same Bible. The Samaritan Pentateuch looks very much like um, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Uh, and Deuteronomy is not exactly clear as to where that mountain of the Lord is. So the Jews took it to be in the south on Mount Zion, and the Samaritans took it to be on Mount Gerizim. Um, John begins this conversation with Jesus, a Samaritan woman. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, give me something to drink. Uh, and Samaritan woman's, you know, it says, you know, why are you, why are you a Jew asking a drink of water for me, a Samaritan? And then it's not clear whether the next line is on her lips or John, the narrator coming in saying Jews don't share things in common with Samaritans, except when they did. Um, the mother of Herod Antipas, the one who executes John the Baptist, is a Samaritan married to King Herod, who's kind of Jewish. Um, so Jews and Samaritans did share things in common, particularly when Rome was a problem, because they played that old game of the enemy, my enemy is my friend. Um, Josephus says sometimes there are friends and sometimes there are enemies. So it was a big question. Could Jews eat Samaritan food? That was an open question because they're under the same dietary laws. So it's both a religious thing and it's an ethnic thing. And the more you move up in rabbinic literature, uh, the less favorable the Samaritans look in Second Temple period, more favorable. Um, you can get a sense of that distinction, and it plays on both sides. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, in the run up to the parable of the Good Samaritan, that's where the, the, the lawyer said, asks about, you know, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Um, right before, and that's then you get the parable of the Good Samaritan. So that's Luke 10. In Luke 9, at the end of Luke 9, Jesus and the entourage, because there's an entourage traveling with him, are going from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south. This is when, when the travel first begins, and it takes them like 10 chapters to get there. Right? So they're just starting out, and they stop off in a Samaritan village, and they ask the Samaritan village for hospitality. And the Samaritans, knowing that Jesus' face is set toward Jerusalem, in other words, they're Jews, refuse this group hospitality. So James and John, in their apostolic best, then say to Jesus, shall we call down fire from heaven and destroy this village? It's a Sodom and Gomorrah moment, because according to Ezekiel, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of lack of hospitality. And Jesus has to explain, uh, you don't drop a bomb because of lack, of lack of hospitality, go find someplace else. So we already have a sense in the New Testament about this distinction. Final point on this, I could go on on this because I really, really like John 4. Um, the reason Jesus and the Samaritan women, women are having a conversation is because the disciples have gone out to get lunch. They're in Samaria. Where are they going to get lunch? So the text, in effect, deconstructs itself even as it begins. Um, as soon as the Samaritan woman says, you know, how come you would you are asking this of me, a Samaritan, because Jews don't share things in common with Samaritans, by asking the question, Jesus has already exploded that particular view. Right. Um, at the end, by the way, he does say to her, um, uh, you worship what you don't know, we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. In other words, in that struggle between who got it right, the Jews on Mount Zion with their Hebrew Bible or the Samaritans on Mount Gerizim with the Samaritan Pentateuch, Jesus sides with the Jews here. So it's not multicultural either. Jesus does not sacrifice the particulars of his view on the altar of multicultural sensitivity. Excellent, thank you, AJ. Uh, another question from an attendee. Uh, as a Samoan, a Pacific Islander, trying to connect the biblical text to my own context, what are your thoughts about biblical hermeneutics and teaching first century texts in a non-Judaic context? 
Thank you for the question. Texts are always read outside of their context and should be read outside of their context. Um, so we talked today about readings from one subject's position or one social location. The way anybody should begin to read a Bible is to say, what does this text mean to me? Right. So and, the, and, the, and then you're off and running. And then you can say, what does this text mean to people in my community, whether the community happens to be Portuguese or Samoan or German or Mexican or Kenyan or whatever. Um, and then you'll find some distinctions there. Uh, but I don't want to let that history go. Because if we let the history go theologically, I think we're denying the incarnation, which happened in a particular time and place. So if we, if we claim to, if the Christian claims to love Jesus, then I think that love includes knowing something about the time and the place where the incarnation and the resurrection happened, right? Um, and if we only read from our own subject position, then what we're doing, and I'm using this, this word particularly here, we are colonizing the text. We are yanking the text out of what it said to an original group of people and saying the only thing that's important is what we do. That's what colonizers do. They, they destroy or seek to destroy the indigenous population and impose their will on it. And I'm not interested in colonizing a text. I'm much more interested in having that conversation. So I begin with the social location and I affirm that social location. My guys in prison see stuff in this text because of their social location that I would never have seen. And I can imagine that if you live um, in Samoa, um, I've done a lot of reading with people in Australia. So I have some sense of, of reading in a Pacific context. They see things that I, I've never seen. And it's so important to have all those multicultural readings. But I also think it's important to have that first century reading as well. Finally, what sometimes happens with multicultural readings, and I've tracked this out from, from publications of the World Council of Churches, and you can see all this discussed in the book that Matthew mentioned, Misunderstood Jew. If you let that historical context go missing, then what frequently happens, especially in liberation theological contexts, is the theologian maps onto Jesus' first century Jewish context, everything that's wrong in present day society. And then Jesus becomes the liberator who reads over against. And if you let the history go and you don't do the history, then I think you're more likely to start conveying or repeating some of those really, really negative stereotypes about Judaism then and now. Thank you, AJ. That's something I find to be quite common is reading Jesus as someone who's a revolutionary against his society, against the authorities, um, and it usually kind of plays down the continuity between his context uh, and the figure of Christ in the texts. Um, let's see, this might make us go over a few minutes, and I hope everyone doesn't mind this, but there's an important question. One of the attendees asks about um, uh, the charge, the, uh, the charge, the deicide charge, which was rejected by Nostra Aetate in section four, mm -hmm. and you mentioned Nostra Aetate earlier, so I thought maybe just for listeners who have not heard this before, uh, perhaps we can just talk just very briefly about um, this, this very ancient and, um, and deadly idea that's also a false idea that's been rejected by the church. Can you read the question for me? Sure. Why has it always been said that the Jews killed Christ? <laughs> well, there you go. Um, it, well, in part because the New Testament says so. First Thessalonians 2.14, be the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and oppose all people. Right. Uh, Acts chapter three, uh, Peter, men, Israelites, you killed the author of life. In the gospel of John, um, after Pilate proclaims Jesus innocent, and in John's version, uh, the high priest backs him into a corner and says, we have no friend but Caesar. And unless you kill this guy, you're no friend of Caesar. Uh, the text reads, Pilate handed him Jesus over to them to be crucified. <clears throat> and the antecedent is the chief priests and, and the Jews who kind of merge into one in the gospel of John. Um, as you go from Mark to Matthew to Luke to John, Pilate looks nicer and nicer, and the Jews look more and more heinous, more and more evil, more and more corrupt. Um, so that by the time you get up to Melito of Sardis, the Jews have not only killed Jesus, they've also killed God. That's Melito's Paschal homily. And that's the way and, they do and it. Melito, and Melito is a, uh, is a uh, early church uh, author. Sorry. Right. I just presume that everybody knows who Melito of Sardis is, right? And everybody knows what Nostra Aetate is. Um, so it, it, it stuck. Um, and it, it, why did Because it, it was easy. Uh, the harder theological questions, you know, it, it's easier to blame the Jews 
than to take on one's own personal responsibility. I think, and Matthew, here, you're the theologian, I'm not, but I think the theological answer to, to, to who killed Jesus is human sin killed Jesus. Jesus dies because of human sin. Um, and when you read Paul, when Paul talks about the night that Jesus was handed over, oh, and here's one of those translation things. Uh, the Greek word paradidomi, didomi means to give, paradidomi, like para, right? means to hand over, right? So you take something from here and you put it over here, paradidomi. The word can also mean betray. So in the gospels, it's Judas, whose name, by the way, means Jewish man. Eh, it's not helpful. It's Judas who paradidomies betrays Jesus. But when Paul talks about, and this is the, the words of institution in 1 Corinthians, um, on the night that Jesus was handed over, right? right? He took bread and he broke. That should sound big, be familiar. Um, the person, the one who hands Jesus over is God the Father. God the Father hands Jesus over and Jesus through his own fidelity goes, goes willingly to the cross. And the Jews have nothing to do with it. But the gospels needed a better story and the Jews wound up getting blamed and it was easier to blame the Jews than it was for the individual Christians to take upon themselves their own responsibility for the death of Jesus. And then because the Jews refused to convert, the church had to figure out what to do with them. Because for the church, for the followers of Jesus, all of whom originally were Jews, by the way, um, they couldn't figure out how come their fellow Jews weren't signing on because it was so obvious to them that Jesus had been raised and that the Messianic age had begun and that they were forgiven from their sins in a new way and they were reborn to new life. That all made so much sense to them. Why didn't the Jews get it? So they came up with different explanations. Matthew says they were misled by their leaders. Okay, but that only works for maybe a generation or so. Uh, Paul says, well, they weren't expected to get it. Paul says in Romans that a hardening has come upon Israel so that the Gentile nations can be saved, that the Jewish branches on the root of Israel were bent and kind of calloused over, and then the Gentile nations were grafted on. The, the, the technical term here is contrary to nature. The wild olive shoots, the Gentile nations were grafted onto that tree contrary to nature, and the idea is that then the Jews will look at all these Gentiles who are now turning from their pagan gods and their pagan ways to worship the God of Israel. And they'll realize, oh, this was right all along. And then Paul concludes that all Israel, by which I think he means all Jews, that all Israel will be saved. But the church didn't go that way. The church went with the Gospel of John, which basically, as I read John and other biblical scholars may debate this, I think John is predestinarian. John says, to, in fact, the Jews who were following him in John 8, you are of your father, the devil. You weren't called. You're not children of God. You're never going to be children of God. Too bad. That's, that's the route the church went. Now, did it have to go that way? No. The amazing thing, the miraculous thing, are texts like Nostra Aetate and various pronouncements that from different Protestant denominations, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the United Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, which has some very good statements, um, the Anglican Communion, um, uh, the Presbyterian Church USA, and so on. They followed the Catholic Church in saying, we're rejecting certain biblical readings. Ultimately, and this also goes to the question of history, and this might be a nice place to end, historians are not gonna resolve this problem. Theologians and ethicists and people in the pews will resolve this problem because history can only get us so far. We have to take readings that are possible in the Bible and determine, and this is just an old saying, I didn't invent it. How do you make the Bible a rock on which you stand rather than a rock thrown to do damage? And given how much damage that rock has done to Jews by Christians over the centuries, how do we figure out how to keep the rock beneath our feet or the rock in our pocket? And instead of throwing rocks, extend kindness. You need theologians and ethicists and people of goodwill on all sides to be able to make that happen. Your program is part of that happening, and I think it's miraculous. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, we'll now turn to Bishop Parks for some closing comments uh, before we sign off. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tapey. And First of all, I want to just say that it's a, uh, an honor and a pleasure for the Diocese of St. Petersburg uh, to partner with the Center for Catholic and Jewish Studies at St. Leo University in presenting this program this evening. Certainly an honor uh, to welcome Dr. Levine with us, and, and I thank you for, uh, for all that you've shared with us this evening. I 
um, have studied theology and scripture a bit, uh, but uh, felt like I was drinking or from a uh, fire hose tonight. <laughs> so maybe some of our participants feel the same way. Uh, but certainly a lot of, of good, very, very good and thoughtful information presented tonight. You know, Dr. You uh, mentioned when you were growing up as a child that you had some Christian uh, friends and uh, kind of brought me back to my childhood up on Long Island, the South Shore of Long Island in New York. Um, we had a friend's uh, family that we knew were, were Jewish. And at one time, our, our neighbors were kind of a multi-faith uh, family. The uh, husband and father was Jewish and the mother was Catholic. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, but basically, we were never really taught about Judaism, other than the fact we knew that they that they didn't go to the same church we went to, and they didn't celebrate Christmas and Easter. <laughs> uh, we weren't taught about that that the Jewish faith or, or Jewish people were were bad or negative in any way. But we we also weren't taught about the richness of of the Jewish tradition and Jewish faith, and and I think that's a shame, you know, because I, I believe it it certainly could have enhanced. Uh, my own understanding of my faith that was passed on to me as a gift, you know, from my parents. Um, I, I do think it's important what we do here tonight in this program. Uh, dialogue is critically important because in the absence of dialogue, um, all kinds of ideas get inserted and, and asserted, uh, which are not good. And that, that has to do not just with Catholic Jewish relations, but also with Catholicism. I mean, I can't tell you how many times as a, as a priest, as a bishop, I've heard somebody say, you know, you Catholics believe, you know, so on and so forth. And of course we don't, that's just their, their misunderstanding of, of what we believe and what we profess. So I think uh, we should never be afraid uh, to dialogue and, and to share with each other. Sometimes I think people are a little hesitant to talk about faith because they think they might say something wrong. Uh, you know, they're not ill-intentioned, but they, they think they might offend somebody or say something wrong, so they, so they don't even engage. And, and I think that's a shame as well. So um, again, I think tonight's important. I think tonight, uh, again, furthers the relationship between um, our, our faiths. I don't think it's possible to, to speak about Catholicism or to teach somebody about Catholicism without um, having an appreciation for the Jewish faith and the Jewish tradition and learning something about it. How can you study scripture, the New Testament, without having some knowledge and learning about Jewish faith and Jewish tradition? So, um, so very, very important. And uh, I know I've benefited from our presentation tonight, and I hope our participants did as well. And uh, I just want to end by just saying thank you to all of our participants who have joined us here this evening. And um, of course, just wish you the very, very best as we go forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Tapey. Thank you, Bishop Parks, very much for your comments and for your participation. Your presence uh, means a lot to us tonight to have this conversation. Um, I want to conclude our program, uh, especially by thanking Dr. Levine for her fine presentation. Uh, one of the things I miss the most about doing an in-person meeting is uh, seeing everyone's faces and clapping together at the end. And I found mm -hmm. that you just can't really clap on these Zoom calls. It really takes something out of it. Uh, I want to thank all of you, members of the community, uh, some students that joined us tonight, uh, faculty, scholars from other universities, uh, folks across Florida and beyond and to, to uh, the, the nation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a video of the program will be added to our CCGS YouTube channel in the coming weeks. You can find it by going to YouTube and searching Center for Catholic Jewish Studies. You can find all of our videos there, but you should see it up in the next two, three weeks. Finally, I want to announce that our next program will be in the fall and feature Dr. Eugene Fisher, who's a very renowned uh, scholar of Catholic Jewish relations and one of the pioneers in the field and one of our own very own St. Leo professors. He'll be receiving the Center for Catholic Jewish Studies Eternal Light Award uh, in November. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Again, Dr. Levine, thank you very much. And uh, everyone have a good night. Bye.